Christ is risen. So, when do you expect good news? When do you expect bad news? It's not hard to think about the last time you received good news. Perhaps it was a joyful announcement of a birth of a child. Perhaps it was someone who had been traveling and made it safely to their destination. Perhaps it was your IRS man calling for good news. I, whatever it is, you, you have greater examples than I could come up with, I'm sure. The time that you received good news and that you were expecting it. You were expecting good news. Not just that you received it, but that you were hoping for it. And then when you received it, you were hoping <coughs> overjoyed or pleased to some degree. Think of that feeling of expectation, of hopeful awaiting for the joy that is about to come. That's a great feeling. Now I'm going to ask you to think about the other thought. Think about the, the last time you expected bad news. A time that, think way back, a teacher caught you sent you home with a bad report, what was your mom or dad going to say when they saw that? You dread that all the way home, right? Think about the time that you expected to hear, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. You know that death is in it. Those are horrible feelings. Compared to the feeling of expectation of joy and hope, the expectation of bad news produces in us dread, despair, hopelessness, anxiety, fear. I'd ask you to think about the visceral response. You know your viscera, your gut. Think about the visceral, visceral response to fear. Many of us feel fear in different places. Sometimes it's in the back of the neck. Sometimes it's here in the chest. Sometimes it's on the forehead. Your body actually has a physical response. And the next time you get spooked or scared, take a moment and think about where you feel that fear versus the dread or anxiety. Those are different. Sometimes they're different visceral feelings in our bodies. But now think about where you feel the visceral feelings of joy. Do you feel Relieve your muscles all relax. Do you feel taller, big? Do you feel like tension is melting away? What is your visceral feeling? Do you get a, a tingling excitement all over? So, now that we've talked about the expectation of bad news and the expectation of good news, well, we better look at the scripture where there's a whole lot of expectation going on. We see here, the women were expecting, what, bad news? Well, no, bad has already happened. They were expecting a continuation of the bad news. Jesus had been crucified. No one walks away from that. And here, you can see their expectation of Jesus, a dead Jesus, still in the tomb. First day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. There's our first clue. Where were they going? To the tomb. I mean, it seems obvious. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Why did they need the stone rolled away? Because they had bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. This was something that was done. So they were going to be the ones to go do this act. So what were they expecting to find? The tomb with the door shut. Sometimes defining our expectation helps us get a clearer picture of what to expect. Think about that. It sounds obvious, but how are you going to respond? 
when the bad news you expect comes to you? How are you going to respond when the good news comes to you? Sometimes we don't think about our response to the things we expect. We may dread the response of someone else, like you bring home that bad grade on the report card. Or we may look forward to the joy of someone else on Christmas morning when they open that special gift that we hand wrapped. Watch their face to see the smile. You look and expect. Or we may have ex expectations of others, but have we defined our expectation of how we will react? Or do we simply react or do we respond? There's a reaction and there's a response. Part of the leadership training you get in seminary and other courses I've been through, it's nothing new, but it's helping folks respond versus react. Our reaction is first thing off the cuff, our gut leaps before our head can think and we react. Oftentimes that's not the safest thing to do. But when you respond, you take time to think before you act. You say, wait a minute, my reaction is, I want to punch you in the nose. But my response is going to be, I'm going to punch you in the nose. <laughs> I mean, maybe you take time to think about it first. <clears throat> but at least you're choosing that response. Do you understand the difference? Your reaction is a thing that happens right away. Your response takes a bit more time. Think about it first. So do we get a reaction or a response from these women? Let's read on and see. So they expected to find the tomb shut, Jesus dead. When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. Well, we don't get a reaction yet, just that they observed that. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Here's our first clue. They were alarmed. Well, wouldn't you be? A contemporary example today, and forgive the crudeness of this, but this is the same. It would be for me to walk out back here. I, I take periodic walks through the cemetery. It's a nice gravel track. It helps me uh, get a little exercise and stretch my legs and clear my head when I've been staring at a screen or sitting at a desk or talking on a phone. I have to walk around a little bit. If I walked out there and suddenly found an open grave, what would I think? Well, maybe they're getting ready to have one, but what if there's already a headstone? What if it's old? Uh-oh. They begin to put the clues together, and I walk over, and I can see the casket's still in the bottom. And it's open, and it's empty. Now what? I look around to see if there are any other graves, and if maybe the rapture is happening. But honestly, what would you do? I mean, it's the same kind of thing. You're expecting to find a uh, nicely manicured grass, or maybe a bouquet of flowers. And instead, you find a gaping hole with an empty casket inside. And not only that, a man steps out from behind the bushes and begins telling you where the body went. Here they come to the tomb. There's a young man sitting there. He tells them. Well, obviously they were alarmed, so what does he say? Don't be alarmed. Right? He said, then don't be alarmed, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Well, this was his last known address, yes. I suppose we're looking for Jesus. I mean, that was slightly more of a humor, but come on, I know it's early. <laughs> he has been raised, he is not here. Look, there's the place that they laid him. How many times does the young man have to say it to get the point across? Beyond the don't be alarmed, they say, looking for Jesus who was crucified, he's been raised, one, he's not here, two, look, there's the place they laid him, three, sort of really walking them through this, you're in shock. I can tell, but he's not here, I know you're looking for Jesus, he kind of walks them through this. The young man in the tomb, we can call him an angelic messenger, that's safe to say, senses their alarm, meets them where they're at. But go, he says, 
Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Interesting, in this gospel he promises to go to meet them at Galilee. Check the other gospels for a different response. Here, he says, go to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Again, the multiple reinforcement for these women who are in alarm. So what's their response? Do they have time to respond? Or do they simply react? They went out and fled from the tomb. That sounds like a reaction to me. They fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. Yeah, they're in the grips of a strong reaction moment. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They needed some time before they could respond to the news that Jesus was raised. What would you do if you were expecting death and you found life, what would you do if you were expecting bad news and you got good news? How would you react to unexpected joy? That's a harder one. Many of us can think of a time when we expected bad news and we got it, or we expected good news and we got it. But can you think of a time when you expected bad news and you got good news? Ah, that's a different kind of moment. All of the visceral feelings of dread, of anxiety, of fear, and of terror are not only gone, they are lifted away in an, in, an endorphin rush of joy. <sighs> Relief. Wow. It didn't turn out that way? You mean the results were negative? Praise the Lord. You mean they made it out of there alive? Oh, you mean they found survivors? Oh, think of moments in people's lives when they expect death and they get life and you find amazing joy, gratitude, a joie de vivre, a joy of life, a readiness to go out and buy ice cream. This is the kind of excitement that comes when we find life instead of death. But we may not get there right away. Just like the women, they reacted. They were shocked. And once they had gotten over the shock, well, we know the rest of the story. We have a whole New Testament full of accounts of Jesus' resurrection. How do you respond to the good news of the resurrection? We've had plenty of time to react. This was a story you've probably heard before. Now, have you responded in your life to the good news of the resurrection? Or has it become simply, well, Jesus is alive, okay. Have we gotten the blasé? We need a yearly reminder of Easter. Really, we need more than that. But we get a big celebration at Easter, a yearly reminder that where we expect to find death, God brings life. Now, in our painful and broken world, that is not always the case. Sometimes where we expect to find death, we find death. But the good news is that death does not have the final say. Remember the Final Destination movies? They were a series of films. I don't know. I really think one was enough. But uh, I didn't even watch all of that. But a series of stories about a group of young people who managed to cheat death, and it chases them throughout the rest of the film, and they die in horrible. It's not, don't worry, don't waste your time on it. There you've heard the plot, it's enough. I used to laugh when I heard that final destination. And there was a time when, uh, I remember Christy and I were going to go see a movie. And we could call up the movie line and find out what movies were playing, and then you could scribble down when the things were. This wasn't pre-internet, but for us it was. So we were writing down the final destination. I can still hear the, the woman's voice on there. And I remember thinking, I know what my final destination is. Not many of us uh, are afraid of death. Most of us make up our minds early on in life to not worry about death so much. But even those of us who are secure in our faith, who understand that Jesus is on the other side of death, that we will have eternal life thanks to that gracious gift, maybe still a little bit, uh, well, we're not too thrilled about the dying part. But we know what our final destination is. We know where to expect to spend eternity. We 
know this is possible because of the great Easter surprise. Where the women looked to find death, they found life, an empty tomb, a resurrected Christ. And oh, get ready for the joy when they meet their Savior again. Are you ready for that? 